Hello and welcome to episode 237 of the official EstablishTheRun.com podcast. My name is Adam Levitan and it is finally here. The best, the purest, the most competitive, the most cutthroat, the highest stakes form of fantasy there is re-enters our life in roughly one week it is officially NFL DFS season, aka the best season today. I am joined by two of the most successful DFS players in the history of the game, two men who have been winning at the highest levels from the pre-boom days back in 2013-14 all the way through to today's era. I personally believe, obviously biased, I personally believe the way they slash we think about DFS is the way to win. It is the Dinkbot himself, Drew Dinkmeyer, and his fellow soulless spreadsheet grinder, Michael Leone. Dink, good morning. How's it going? It's going great. I don't have a lawn to take care of here in New York City. So, you know, I feel I feel aligned with the group. You know, I can be both on Silva's side of, of uh, you know, theoretically getting my hands in the dirt and on Leone's side to pay someone to take care of everything for me. So it's great. Leone, good morning. Good morning. Love it, Tan. Do you mow your own lawn? <laughs> Buddy, are you crazy? <laughs> exactly. I mean, I knew the answer before I asked you, but I just wanted to be clear that I'm not, you know, on an island here as far as the ETR group and their lawn care goes. All right. Over the next three episodes, we're going to talk about three DFS related topics. Today, we will be talking about how to beat large field tournaments, such as the DraftKings Millie Maker. On the next episode, episode 238, we will discuss how to use an optimizer correctly. Incredible amount of misconceptions around that. And on episode 239, we will hit on what actually matters when projecting how players perform on Sundays and when you're building lineups. Cut through a lot of the BS. Before we get into that, I know, well, I hope, most of you listening already have our 34.99 draft kit. If you want to play DFS this season and or you want access to our in-season content, such as rest of season rankings, Silva's matchups, Thorman's rankings, etc. You want the bundle. Email support at establishtherun.com. And by the way, for a full schedule of our in-season product, go to the Our Team drop down on the site. You'll find it there. All right, let's get into it here, boys. By large field tournaments, we essentially mean these GPPs, aka guaranteed prize pools, where we put up a little to try to win a lot, you know, 20 to win a million, five to win 100K, you know, tens of hundreds of thousands of entrants. And we went through, as we do each year, and looked through the Millie Maker, Leone, and we found certain data points compared what we're doing, what we should be doing, or what the winners are doing, what the top 100 people are doing, compared to what the field is doing. And one of the things that the field is doing, we'll start right here, is stacking is the field now stacking enough, Leone? And specifically, are they double stacking enough? Because there was a time in DFS where people simply were not stacking enough, period. I'm not sure that's the case anymore, but I think they're not double stacking enough, period, now. So talk to the people about stacking a little bit. Yeah, what we saw last year in the Millie Maker is the field, so teams outside the top 100 in the Millie Maker played double stacks about 29% of the time, but the teams inside the top 100 of the million maker played double stacks about 40% of the time. So there's quite a bit of leverage there. Honestly, I was a little bit surprised by that because I think in these, I mean, this is as large of a field as you can possibly get. And you do have to be pretty close to perfect that I thought maybe a single stack might get there a little bit more just because I was worried the ceiling on a double stack might not get there, but the data bared that out. It's something that you always have to take into account the context of the week. I think the pricing of the double stack matters a lot as to you know how much it can get there. You know, as much upside as DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett have, if they're both 8K, it might be hard for them to get there. Whereas there were weeks sometimes where, you know, if you get an 8K receiver and a 5K receiver or you know, a 7K receiver and a 4K tight end, it's a little bit easier to get there. That second guy doesn't have to hit as high of a raw ceiling and he can get that he can hit his ceiling you know 95th percentile on value and still have the expensive guy there smash so definitely take into account price and how the targets are distributed it doesn't mean you have to double stack every single team but it was quite a bit of positive leverage on the field last year dink are you ever running anything naked anymore and let's talk about rushing quarterbacks a little bit because we're going to get to quarterback Soon, a lot of people say, wait, you guys say to double stack every quarterback. Am I really double stacking with Lamar? Am I really double stacking with Kyler? Do I have to double stack with, 
Josh Allen, how do you think about double stacks and single stacks and even naked as you're making your teams for large field tournaments? Yeah, so I, I no longer play naked quarterbacks at all. Um, there's pretty much no, no exceptions to that, even with the high volume rushing quarterbacks like Lamar Jackson. I think if they're going to have a, a week that is going to be able to win a, a million maker, they're probably throwing a touchdown somewhere in there. It's probably not just all coming on the ground. So at least a single stack. I do allow single stack entries in with Russian quarterbacks like Kyler Murray, like Lamar Jackson. Uh, Josh Allen is, is, is kind of a, a borderline option just because he throws so much volume on DraftKings. We saw the Bills come out in their preseason game and just go like stretch the limits of pass rate even further, basically. But I think they ran one run play while with the starters. So uh, he's going to give you so much reception volume that I think you want to have two receivers with him. But generally the quarterbacks that are going to, uh, get a lot of their value from their legs. I think you can single stack. And, and in general, you know, it's a small list. It, it, most of the quarterbacks that you're going to be playing in these large field GPPs, I think you still want to be strongly double stacking. The data uh, continues to bear that out. And I think the point that Mike made about average cost on the stack that you're investing in is really important. Maybe the more important kind of takeaway from all this is you really want to be thoughtful of how much upside you can get from the cost you're spending into one situation. And generally for me, that's going to end up somewhere around like 17 to 19 K is around the, the range that I'm looking for kind of my double stack from the trio. Yeah. And what do you think about positionally Dink? And we'll get to this a little bit more later, but do you consider a double stack with running back? Do you consider a double stack with tight end or is it always wide receiver, wide receiver? Almost always wide receiver, wide receiver, uh, occasionally wide receiver, tight end, and very rarely wide receiver, running back. The wide receiver, running back situation, you really need the price to be right. The difference on the running backs is if you think conceptually about kind of where their upside comes from, is a lot of their upside can come individually from, you know, um, separate from the quarterback in terms of their rushing value and their rushing touchdowns and their upside there. So it's got to be a running back that really does get a substantial amount of their volume from the passing game. Um, and obviously those are the ones we're often looking for generally, but those are often also the most expensive. And so when you're thinking about the overall average cost of kind of these stacks as well, you know, sometimes the guys like Christian McCaffrey or Alvin Kamara, they might actually be tougher to include in these types of double stacks, just because the costs associated with including them in that group, you want that upside to sort of come isolated from the passing game a little bit, because you know, a lot of the production is going to come there. Sure. Okay. This whole idea of bringing it back has gotten very popular over the last, I don't know, year to year and a half in DFS. And what I mean by bringing it back is let's say you have a double stack. Let's say you have Dak, uh, Amari Cooper, and CeeDee Lamb, and they're playing against the Washington football team. A bring back would be Terry McLaurin or Logan Thomas or Antonio Gibson or something like that. What do you think about bring it back, Leone? What does the data say? And does it need to be a certain position or should it be a certain position when we are quote unquote, bringing it back? Yeah. Data says you definitely want to be bringing it back. And there's a few reasons. First of all, we're trying to increase correlation. You know, it's really hard to hit an eight leg parlay if it's uncorrelated. And some of the biggest upside comes from games that just end up shooting out and you get really high passing statistics on both sides of the ball. And the other thing with bringing it back is unlike the double stack where we have to be a little bit more cognizant of cost because the two wide receivers maybe cannibalize each other's true ceiling. We have to think about it a little bit more. That doesn't happen with the bring back. That guy has a pure ceiling outcome that has helped. His 99th percentile outcome on a bring back receiver is highly correlated with, you know, the stacks 99th percentile outcome on the other side of things. So there's no, you know, there's no detraction to doing a bring back, whereas the double stack, the pros outweigh the cons, but there are some cons. So that's important. And I like to do it at the wide receiver position. Similarly with the double stack, I think wide receiver is the best to stack because it is a volatile position that has a really high ceiling. And it's also a spot where sometimes we see ownership spread out a little bit more. So it's not only do we get the correlation at wide receiver with the stack at a little bit higher level than we do the other positions, but we also get really good. Like those are just good positions to make leverage plays to begin with. So you take the position that's best to you know take leverage plays. And by that, we mean guys that have high ceilings, but low ownership. So that combined with the correlation of the game stack just makes it really natural that 
for the most part, your double stack, your bring back, you want it concentrated on the wide receiver position, unless you have a very specific reason not to. Yeah, I mean, the the thing about the Millie Maker on DraftKings in these really large field tournaments is that it's so big. I mean, you almost need, or you do need the absolute perfect lineup to get there. And so we've seen people do double stacks or triple stacks or bring it back with two guys, like full-blown game stacks. And I get the idea behind that. Dink, it's just really hard because as guys are cannibalizing each other in a game, you need the game to be like 52 to 45 for things like that to hit. Are people doing that too much? Do you think, and how do you think about these full-blown game stacks, bring it back with more than one guy or a triple stack and stuff like that? Yeah, the the thing that I'd answer there in terms of whether people are doing it too much, I, I think just generally people are not separating their lineup construction ideas based on field size in general. And so that means, yes, they're probably doing it a little too much in really, really large fields, these massive 100,000 plus entries. And, you know, they might even be doing it too little in really small fields. Um, in terms of, you know, 40 entry contests and different things like that. And that's honestly because of the upside that's necessary to win these contests. A lot of people will say like, oh, you know, I could win so much money at high stakes if I just entered my team in this in this contest that, you know, they take their best out of their 150, but they wouldn't be entering 150 lineups into a 40 person contest. The reason isn't because the stakes uh, determine how good of a team is required to win. It's the number of entries in the contest. And so a lot of times these full blown game stacks they don't have the overall ceiling unless, as you alluded to, it's like one of those the Chiefs Rams game from years ago that was actually a showdown game that ended up being you know 90 total points. It has to blow the field away in terms of the other games on the slate in terms of offensive production to really allow that, and it's got to do it in a very specific way. Really high pass rate over expectation because on DraftKings everything is PPR centric. So the more completions you get in a game, the more upside there is, and so. Generally, the the double stack with the bring back is kind of the nice middle ground of being able to capitalize on finding the right game environment, but not putting all of your chips in that one game environment being so dominant to all the other games on the slate. Yeah. And and to, go ahead. To Dink's point, like looking at the actual data, the best leverage, like I said, clearly at wide receiver and the field brought back a single wide receiver 25% of the time last year, the top 100 teams did it 48% of the time, nearly double what the field did. So the field, even though they're doing it, 25% sounds like a high mark, you know, clearly not enough, you know, clearly the top 100 teams are getting there by increasing their correlation specifically with the bring back at the wide receiver position. Okay. Let's get to a question. A lot of people have how much of my salary cap should I spend? I feel like people are so focused on being unique at the cost of anything, at the cost of projection, at the cost of, of just having a good team. They're like, well, I can't spend the whole cap. Only fish spend the whole cap. I think that it's actually like that kind of meme where like in the middle, like people are thinking like that. And on both of the edges, people are like spend the whole cap, spend the whole cap. <laughs> right. And so uh, our data found that the field is actually not spending or it really doesn't matter. Like people should be spending as much as they possibly can. Leonie, what do we what does the data say about how much of the cap they should be spending in these large field tournaments? Yeah, basically that. It doesn't matter too much. Essentially, the more salary cap you sacrifice, the more projection you sacrifice overall. We actually saw the top 100 teams use the full cap more frequently than the field teams did because you know, it's not like DFS golf, you know, where you're worried about dupes. You're going to get a unique lineup. And at that point, you just want the highest upside in your lineup possible. And generally that means spending to the full cap. You know, if you make a team and you love, and it's at 49, nine, I'm not recreating that team to get to 50 K. But if I make a team that's at 49, four, I'm probably thinking long and hard, you know, if there's an improvement I can make here to increase my ceiling. Yeah. But the idea is that there's so many permutations that are possible in a lineup that you don't have to worry about dupes. So what you want to worry about is just maximizing your upside as much as possible. Yeah, 100%. I don't think we need to go too much further in there. If we were talking about showdown, we could have more conversations about leaving money on the table for these large field tournaments. Again, we're talking about the DraftKings Millie Maker using most or all the cap, I think is almost certainly right. Let's move on, Dink, to what we should be using in our flex spot. And people are always asking, you know, there was a time people thought it was sharp to use two tight ends because they were so underpriced on DraftKings. I never really bought in to that there's also a time when it was right i thought to use three running backs when running backs were underpriced when Le'Veon bell and guys like that were extremely underpriced relative to their role now what we're seeing is wide receiver in the flex is actually the most leverage i think i don't want to say there's 
outlier, but we know the NFL kind of changed a bit last year. We know Christian McCaffrey was hurt. We know Saquon Barkley was hurt. So I think there's some context needed here on what we should be using in the flex, but how do you think about your flex spot? Correlation aside, just think about how you use your flex spot. Well, I think the evolution of the flex spot that you just touched on there is something that's really important to understand because what that means is if we're having constantly an evolution, it means that something is changing that is dictating why we're going in a different direction in each year. And when you talked about before using running backs often in the flex spot, that's because running back prices were softer. Well, DraftKings increased the salary floor of the running backs from 3000 to 4000 last year. And all of a sudden, a lot of the softness in the pricing was re- removed from those midweek injuries or those injury situations that weren't clear when they released pricing. Now, all of a sudden, these backup running backs are priced at you know, 4600 4800 5200 and they're just not as clear a plays. And so what this really means is, depending on how the game kind of evolves from a salary perspective, you're going to maybe be changing the strategy over time. It's not going to be something that's going to be static. That's going to be, this is the way to play forever and always. The other part that you mentioned there was kind of the evolution of the NFL as a whole. We're moving in a lot of the running back situations to more sort of timeshare or play type dependent running backs where you get a, a traditional third down back, you get you know a, an early down bruiser, and you get also the kind of rotated carries. You're also getting fewer carries to deal with, and you're getting more wide receivers out on the field as offenses go to kind of these spread situations and the pass rate uh, continues to increase. And so all of those trends are moving in the direction of wide receiver in the flex position. Now we'll see how things adjust over time, whether the NFL evolves back into, you know, giving more volume to running backs in the passing game or different things like that, splitting them out wide, or whether the game evolves in terms of uh, wide receiver floor salary increasing or different things like that, that will change the nature of this discussion. But for right now, all the trends are moving in the direction of passing rate increasing, floor on running backs increasing, wide receivers being more valuable in that flex position. Yeah, I mean, last year you were just absolutely torching money by playing running back or tight end in the flex in these really large field tournaments. Both had really bad negative leverage. Wide receiver leverage was 45% of the field versus 56% of top 100 teams had wide receiver in the flex. The other thing too with wide receiver, and this goes back to why we said it makes sense to bring it back with a receiver and do the double stack with only receiver, is it's just one of the more volatile positions. So that means two things their pricing is more likely to be off, which means they have a higher ceiling relative to price because of that volatility. So they have a higher ceiling relative to price than the other two positions. And then also the ownership's likely to be lower on these guys because people are game log chasing and there's just a lot of options. So those two reasons just make wide receiver in a vacuum a better GPP play Mm -hmm. than the other two positions. Yeah, and that's part of the the thesis behind the air yards by by low bottle, which will once again be part of the in-season pack is trying to find wide receivers with good volatility with upside who won't be as owned. Let's talk about ownership because this is always a, a, a conversation that people want to have. Am I being too chalky? Am I not being chalky enough? Leone, what do you think about how much ownership we should have in our lineup in these large fields like the Millie Maker? Yeah, it's kind of like the Goldilocks thing where there's the the too hot, too cold, just right type thing. And what we found, what the field does wrong is they're on the ends too much. And, and they generally play lineups that are way too contrarian overall, or they play lineups that are way too chalky overall. And you kind of want to be in the middle. And we found between 75 and 125% cumulative ownership was that sweet spot. Now within the lineup, it does make sense to take kind of a barbell strategy where you're mixing low owned players. You can still get in some high owned players. You probably want to avoid the tippy top of the high owned players. You probably want to avoid the very, very bottom of like these guys that are just have really few outs to hitting their ceiling, but it is better to take, you know, like a 5% guy and a 30% guy than it is, you know, two 20% guys. So Getting in the middle of that cumulative ownership and too far extreme on the others. And then within that lineup, taking a little bit of a barbell approach. Yeah, exactly. And the data was found that we can write, it's okay to roster guys, even up to 40%. Like it's okay to eat the chalk up to 40%, but let's not have 20, 20, 40. Let's have 43, five in terms of ownership on our players like that. Dink, when you're making your large field tournament lineups, I know there's context here because sometimes like, a guy, a guy is just like, can your cumulative ownership go above 125% yeah. when there's some really, really outrageously strong plays that maybe are obvious yeah. also? 
Yeah. And so the, the week that I'd hearken back to, and I use settings um, on the optimizers, you know, in the fancy labs optimizer that I use, these settings to limit the amount of uh, the total like rostered player uh, roster ship or ownership that I'm using. And so for me, the, the example that I'd go back to is Taysom Hill when he was a tight end on FanDuel and he was min price and he was playing at the quarterback position. And that player was going to be used in almost all lineups. Well, if you're using a player constraint on that and you've got a projected amount where it's like 70, 80%, you're nat- naturally going to start to eclipse that mark. And so you need to be thoughtful whenever you're kind of going through these situations and understand that each week is a unique situation. These rules generally apply over time, but there are going to be some unusual cases. And a starting quarterback min price at the tight end position is going to be one of the most uh, abnormal cases that we'll ever deal with. So you want to keep these things in mind, but generally, you know, the mark for me is around 100 to 115 is generally like the range that I'm cutting off on kind of the high end for for some of the really large stuff but i adjust that each and every week based on how strong the chalkiest of chalk plays are if they're really really strong and they're projected for 40 50 percent i know that i'm going to have to use those players in a lot of my lineups as is because that's the best path it doesn't mean i need to use all the chalkiest players in the same lineup but you want to kind of stretch those boundaries based on how strong you think the chalk is each and every week yeah okay last thing i want to talk about is positions and how it correlates to fantasy points. So we have a lot of data here. If you go to the Millie Maker article, it's on the site under analysis. We have a lot of data here on what correlates between DraftKings salary and actual fantasy points, Millie Maker ownership and DraftKings points, and then our projections and fantasy points. Shout out to us. Obviously, we're just smashing both of those previous two with our projections. Leonie, what, did ta- what are your takeaways here from all these correlations between what people are doing with ownership and DraftKings points, salary and fantasy points, and our projections? And actual points. Yeah. I mean, we see with the correlations that quarterback has the highest correlation across all three buckets, whether it's, it's roster ship to points, whether it's drafting salary to points or our projections to points. So what we saw last year, at the quarterback position is it became a little bit, the predictability was there and the guys up top started to separate a little bit more. We'll see if that happens again this year. It'll be interesting to watch, but when that happens at a position that's a little bit more predictable, you know, we kind of found that we had to pay up for an expensive quarterback pretty frequently because the separation and the predictability was there. I will note that the, you know, the correlation between roster ship and DraftKings points, it makes sense that that's a little bit lower because people are considering value and not just total points scored when selecting the players that they're taking. So that one makes sense, but I did was really happy that the ETR projections outperform the DraftKings salaries, which are, you know, supposed to be in line specifically with um, total points scored. We beat those by quite a bit. We do see that, again, wide receiver has a lower correlation than running back. That's that volatility that I talked about, why those guys are pretty good options uh, in, in tournaments, in the flex and in the stacks. And then the other thing, I know DST isn't a super fun thing to talk about, but what happens with DST is the correlations are so low across the board that people in general are picking too chalky of defenses and they're paying too much for defense. It's a position where the cheapest of defenses from a ceiling perspective has a similar ceiling to the most expensive defenses, just the way the points are scored. Their probability of hitting it might be lower. You know, their median expectation might be lower, but it's not like wide receiver where a guy who has four targets can't hit the same ceiling as a guy who has 10 targets. So it does make sense to you know, kind of suck it up and be a little bit risky and play some cheap defenses, mix those in. Even if you, you know, think on the surface, they're really bad plays, you know, play the DST roulette. That's a really good way to get advantage on the field. And it can be a huge leverage. If you get a DST that scores two touchdowns, I mean, you could be picking up 12 points on so many teams in the field. So don't be afraid to go contrarian there. Yeah. I mean, this has been like my DFS 101 for a long time, completely punted off at defense. Like I'm willing to spend as little as 2K, 1900 on defense, even in cash when I think it's a good spot. Punted off at tight end, which, you know, Kelsey has shoved it down my throat a few times. I still think that for the most part, it's been right to pay down at tight end. We can get there with guys who are 2800, Logan Thomas and stuff like that. The difference now, though, go ahead. I was going to say tight end's a little weird, too. The correlations are very low relative to the other skill players. So you could make an argument that you should just punt it off because it's volatile, but like the flip side is 
if I'm paying up at tight end for Kelsey, I'm like more likely to realize that Mm -hmm. advantage at tight end because all the cheap tight ends, other people are taking, they're just spinning a roulette wheel on those tight ends. So absolutely. Absolutely. Both ways. Absolutely. But the, the the big difference last year, Dink, and the last point I want to make here before we wrap up is the whole difference at quarterback last year. And whereas I used to spend down at quarterback last year, even in cash, I started paying 7K, 7,500 without blinking an eye at quarterback because of these crazy rushing guys. And Leone's talked about it tons, consistency and ceiling in Josh Allen, Kyler Murray, Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson, Russ Wilson, Deshaun Watson. I mean, all these guys, it's just created such a big gap between the pocket passers where we're just trying to pick off matchups. So on the surface, it seems like the quarterback position has changed a lot. Can we even get there with like a 4,900 Sam Darnold or a 5,100 Zach Wilson anymore? It seems really hard when compared to these guys who are going to run also. What do you think about the quarterback position now in this large field stuff? So I think last year was a, a really directional change in the way that we approached the quarterback position. I think, thankfully, it's something that we recognized fairly early in the season and started implementing through, you know, Mike and I talked a lot about it on the Establish uh, the Million Show. And I think going into this year and beyond, there's going to be more turnover and more evolution in terms of how we evaluate that position, because I think you are getting more Russian quarterbacks coming through the college ranks and, and into the NFL. And basically the reason we would all spend down before is quarterbacks couldn't separate from each other as much because their skill sets were all some, somewhat similar. And I think right now we have this divergent of approach in the league where we still have some of the old heads in terms of, you know, Tom Brady is going to play till he's, you know, 65 apparently and keep throwing touchdown passes and Aaron Rodgers and these guys who don't run, who can get there on, you know, volume of an, an efficiency on, on the touchdown side. But we have all these younger quarterbacks that are coming in that are mobile, whether it's Trevor Lawrence or um, Trey Lance or, or Justin Fields uh, or Zach Wilson. And so over time, as we get an influx of those rushing oriented quarterbacks, now you'll get to a point where the skill differentiation is somewhat similar and maybe you can kind of go back down in price. Or if DraftKings pricing tightens substantially and gets much, much more tight where all the floors on all the players are raised, yes, you might be paying down a quarterback. But for what we saw last year where pricing was generally pretty loose, I know the running back floor did increase, but generally pretty loose. And you had this um, basic, you know, polarity in in, uh, upside from the quarterback position. It made sense to pay up. And I think early in the season, we might have some similar situations. It really depends on how quickly some of these rookie quarterbacks come into play and and whether they're getting the starts week one and whatnot. But I think over the course of the season, there will still be opportunities to potentially pay down. But certainly those like pure pocket passers that you're looking at for, you know, 5,000 and and they don't have a huge offense that can generate a lot of upside. Those are only going to be most useful in situations where pricing is really, really tight or the high-end receivers or the high-end running backs have a monstrous upside relative to their uh, cheaper counterparts. And that's the the real thing that you have to understand is last year when we lost some of those high-end running backs as well, we lost Christian McCaffrey for a while. We lost Saquon Barkley for a while. Well, there was nowhere to spend on that high-end running back side. So the one thing that I'd say is we're in an evolution at the quarterback position that needs to be constantly evaluated. Last year may end up looking like an outlier when you combine the lack of high-end running back production with some of the uh, dispersion and quarterback results. But over time, the value of the rushing quarterbacks is really, really substantial. And the more of them we get into the league, the cheaper we can go down the pricing spectrum. Yeah. Go ahead, Leone. Anything on quarterbacks before we get out of here? Yeah, I just, in general, just don't be afraid to be early on guys. You know, as Drew mentioned, we got some rookie quarterbacks and some other guys. Now the rookie quarterbacks might be hyped up, so they might come with roster ship right away. But I know last year Wiggins and I qualified for the DraftKings final because everyone was playing these expensive quarterbacks, thought they had to at this point in the season, it was later in the season. And we took Jalen Hurts when people didn't know what to expect, but we knew he had the rushing upside. So if the ceiling's there, don't be afraid to be early. And that extends outside the quarterback position too. A lot of guys last year returning from injury, I had success, you know, a huge Debo Samuel game. McCaffrey had a huge game where there were reports he might be limited. Austin Eckler did. If you wait to see it, the everybody else is waiting to see it too. And they're going to play that person the next week. So don't be afraid to to be aggressive, you know, rostering some of these players before you see what you hope to see, you know, that's kind of how you're going to get your edge in a large field tournament, obviously in a cash game setting, you want to wait to see it because you care a little bit more about floor. 
Yeah, 100%. By the way, if you guys enjoyed this, I really think, I mean, I know I'm biased, but if you're playing tournaments, small field or large field, you must listen to Establish the Million every Saturday with Dink and Leone, the highest level discussion of tournaments each week, part of our in-season package, of course. Okay, we've said it all. Now, I mean, if you don't go out and win a million, it's almost like a surprise because it's it's we've just laid out exactly how to do it. It's just a stone lock. Okay. For Dink, for Leone, for Producer Luke, I am Adam. Good luck, everybody.